everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, like a dog for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You wish now that our places had been exchanged, and I had died and Boromir had lived. Yes, I wish that. Since you were robbed of Boromir, I will do what I can in his stead. If I should return, think better of me, Father. That will depend on the manner of your return. And that's a little piece of Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Now, I wonder if you recognize the voice there. This week, we are joined by someone you know, and you either love him, or I think you could say you love to hate him. John wow. Noble has directed more than oh. 80 plays. And among other roles was that role in Lord of the Rings that we just heard. You also know him best as Walter Bishop in Fringe. He was participated in that tremendous show, which we'll talk about for five years. He also was uh, Henry. Henry Parrish in Sleepy Hollow. Even later, he was Sherlock Holmes' dad in Elementary. There's so much to discuss in so little time. Welcome to Everything Old is New Again, John Noble. Thank you very much, Douglas. Lovely to be here, mate. Let's talk a little bit about what we just heard, if you don't mind. Mm. An, an apparently evil, apparently evil man, someone who hates his son and is uh, ruthless, if you will, in his quest for power. Uh, and yet I'm sure when you as an actor uh, create and inhabit that role, you look for a backstory as to what made this person this way, I presume. Because none of us really think of ourselves as acting in an evil way, I presume. So maybe we could start off with that kind of an idea is getting to your head a little bit yeah look it's it's a really good question i don't approach any character uh, as bad good indifferent and i don't do that what i do is i look at the character very carefully now in the case of uh, and i do do the background in the case of denethor uh in in Lord of the rings i mean he was a major character in the third film and he had a little appearance in the second but i there was there wasn't much background given on him uh, Douglas, and so I, I then researched went back uh, through the books and so forth and found some information uh, and uh, then went to some other literature and found some more. And uh, I had to find the inner, the, the inside of the man. And I did. I did. Why does, an, why does a person behave that way? Uh, that's not normal. I mean, you can imagine, we're both fathers. Imagine saying that to your son. That, right. uh, when he said, yeah, I wish it was you, it was one of the hardest lines to deliver uh, that I've ever had because it's, well, it brings tears to my eyes now. A rotten thing to say. So, uh, the, but the background helped me. I, I w went back and worked out, for example, uh, that uh, he had been married to Findulis, beautiful woman. She'd given, born him a Boromir who he adored. And then came along uh, this second fellow. And what, in my mind, I don't know if this is fact or not, but I, I, I decided that he, she died in childbirth. That's what I decided, which causes his resentment towards this boy that came through, uh, and who was also affected by Gandalf. But but his real reasoning was, I mean, he was still heartbroken. Uh, he, he he was he was only the steward after all, and 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 you know, uh, rangers from the north were around the place, and, and it was all falling down. He was a very sick and sad man by the time you met him. Very sick and sad, totally alone, no friends, nothing. And, and, and that uh, certainly makes sense because, in other words, this person's life, when we watch movies or plays mm -hmm. or TV, we have the tendency uh, to sort of think that that is, because that's the first scene, let's, let's just say the first scene we see yeah. of this character is the beginning of their life, if you will, and certainly that's not the case. Certainly there's all these, this that happened before they came onto the screen. So I think what you're, you're delivering to us is an interesting point of view that uh, that's why actors do this and why... All of us should remember, of course, that these characters have lived before they've arrived on the screen and have their motivations developed before uh, that even occurred. Um, uh, yeah, look, it has to be. Yeah, I, I've, I've played a lot of uh, heavies, heavy characters, and, and uh, complex characters in my time, but I never think of them as such going into that. You know, Morland Holmes was an example of a very stitched up, wealthy English fellow who, who, who was... But one of the world controllers, you know, that, that group of people that we assume are controlling things in the world now, we're right. And this is not a conspiracy theory. Uh, and he was—he he knew everything. He was above government. 
but I had to go back and find some, something in him. And uh, I went back and found the father in him, you know? You'd understand this. I found the father and his uh, stuffed up love uh, for his family. Uh, and that, that took me through. And he thought, you know, he thought he was doing Faramir a, a, a favour uh, when he, after Faramir returned wounded from the battle, uh, he decided this is finished, uh, I'm finished. Well, then he said, he has a line, he says, no tombs for Denethor and Faramir, no long so sleep of death embalmed. We shall die like the heathen kings of old. And that was done as he was going, walking along to get on the get, get on the, uh, you know, the wood pile there with his son. Great scenes. There were great scenes. But uh, he, he thought, no, we, he and I, the last of the tribe, we will go out like the pagan kings of old, which was basically burning to death. Yeah. So there was a... He thought he was doing the right thing. Right. Uh, and, and that... In, in that example. How else could yeah? you play it in some ways, right? Otherwise, you'd hate the part, to, the part itself in, in a way. And I would say this, because I've heard you say this uh, in the past, that you're an observer and that some, from observing people, whether it be in a restaurant or wherever, uh, that you said, you know, people are funny and uh, certain from their interactions, they're funny. And uh, tell us in some way, if I'm right about that, that uh, observation uh, is not always, my, my wife calls it gawking. Sometimes I look at other people, what they're doing, and I, I sort of do the same thing. Uh, but she doesn't like me. You know, you're gawking again, you know. Uh, she says in a derogatory manner, but maybe we should look at that a little bit and see that, you know, it's okay to observe others. And, and maybe you can explain a little bit about why, if I'm correct, about that, why you do that? What what does that inform you uh, or about people and about the, the world, if you will? Well, okay, it's a great, it's a great. Yeah, I do observe people, and I do have the same problem with my wife as your wife, which is gawking, and the so. But I do watch sometimes, and uh, I look at the mannerisms, and I try to work out what's going on behind this person's mind. The conversations, I can actually tune into conversations too, but it's more the body language. And so you look at the body language of someone, then you start to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that kind of leads me on to take elements of that. I don't, I don't say, oh, I'll use that. It's there or it's not there. And uh, so many times something that I've thought of this nature will appear as a solution to a problem I'm facing with a role. So it, it, it's a good thing. And, and it's something that you, you use, and of course we, we all uh, could use to just kind of empathize, if you will, or understand where other people are coming from, especially this day and age. And, 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 and along those lines, you know, I have uh, young children, and, um, and I know you have children, and my thought is, is this, off the top of my head, uh, I did a little research there, Broadway itself last year before all this business uh sold 15 million tickets and now think about this new york has got you know uh, two baseball teams it got two uh, hockey teams it has two uh, basketball teams and then some and those tickets all added together for all of those games do not add up to more than 15 million t tickets so my thought is for a child you know isn't it time isn't it okay to give our kids permission to enjoy theater and participate in theater at their level as opposed to you know it has to just be sports kind of a thing i think we've we we can kind of evolve a little bit towards uh giving theater a little more due am, am i for children and and uh, in that in that way does that make sense yeah, it does. I don't think anything on Broadway is aimed towards children specifically. You know, some of the musicals and so forth that kids love to go to, ones that have been running for a long time. But no, it's, not, it's, it's aimed at getting in the, the full price tickets if you can. That's the nature of the business. It's a uh, they got to make the money, or they they close very quickly too. Well, John, I'm talking about though for for us to use as an example that it is that popular that it's okay then for children to participate in the play in their school. Let's say, uh, yeah. Oh my God, yes. Now I see where you're going. Ah, so it's it's not a sort of a, a, a soft and uh, non male or, or non whatever. It's none of the. It's fun. It's absolute fun. And uh, you, if, if you can create the, uh, I've taught a lot of kids. If you can create the right atmosphere for kids, this is important. Safe place, fun, no one's going to run all over them, then you get magic out of them. My daughter is a teacher and uh, teaches youngsters and, and has created these extraordinary events. She creates a safe space and these people come to a part of our home, big, big area where she teaches, and they just go into this extraordinary world, uh, fantasy world, you know, as they come through the door, they, 
And, and I watched this stuff in amazement and her energy and her brilliance with the kids. And uh, that, I think, is a great example of what you can do with kids. She has this thing called Little Rascals, might be on there. But it's fantastic watching the work. And I, I'd say to her, I say, God, you're a much better teacher than, than I am. And I taught her, but she's just amazing with, with kids. And it's great to see someone that, uh, and we'll talk about this on the other side of the commercials here, uh, that is interested in that, and, and I'm interested in that. I think it's a, a good aspect of or additional something that children can do as they're growing up to help develop their personality. We'll be back right at this on Everything Old is New again with John Noble. Uh, come on back. We'll continue with some discussion of Fringe. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Ooh. Viviani and David Cohen. And Douglas and David, I tell you, I read it. And when I get to the end, yeah, it does have a four-page scene with me and John, great actors in uh, Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah, it is about spirituality. It is about loss of faith. And it is about his, his fear that his son is, like, playing too much on the science side and not enough on the, on the faith side. And, yes, it is about a guy going back in time, and you think he's going back in time to try to save his fiance and John says to me, you know, you can't do that. People die on God's time. You can't resurrect the dead. You know, it's a beautiful, beautiful stuff, man. The polemic that people have talked, ever, you know, about ever since since Plato, for crying out loud, or earlier, maybe the Egyptians. Ah, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. That's the uh, friend of our show. He's been on our show 13 times, as, as all the listeners know. Peter Weller, talking about Fringe. We are here talking with John Noble, uh, Walter Bishop himself from Fringe. Peter Weller was talking about an episode, a specific episode called White Tulip. And uh, I just thought, to me, uh, I, I'm a big science fiction fan. Everyone listening to this show knows that we try to work in a Star Trek reference into every episode. And certainly Peter Weller was in Star Trek uh, uh, Into the Darkness. But besides that, the point being is that episode to me and the show in general, but let's just talk specifically for a moment about White Tulip, is a seminal piece of science fiction and drama. And to me, a masterpiece in acting and writing. And I just want to, right off the bat, I'm surprising uh, you, John, with uh, the Peter Weller quote there. But do you, you capture what he's saying in that small period of time? We had him on for the show talking about lots of things. And, and he was developing the idea that of, of what the theme was behind that particular episode. Of course, you've done a lot since then. And I wonder if you even remember the episode it's not really fair for me to throw that at you but uh i just want to see what your reaction is to that yeah okay there's a couple of couple of strong reactions one uh, i think white tulip was one of the three best episodes that were made it was an amazing episode truly um the writer had said to me earlier uh, i'm going to create the scene between you and this other character he said, he said it's going to be very long and, and intense, uh, and uh, and then I waited to see who they cast, and they cast Peter Weller, and he can do all those things. He, he came onto the show, and I don't know if he knew what to expect, but what happened is what, once we, he and I connected as actors, there's that buzz, that, there's something goes up the back of your neck, and says, Jesus, this is on, this is on, man. And that happened to me, and I think it happened to him. And we, we nailed those scenes, mate, uh, just nailed them, and, uh, and that was... Uh, that was a, a wonderful uh, trust thing between two actors, too. He, he said, okay, this bloke knows what he's doing. I can trust him. And I said the same about him. And then we went on to do it. And Peter Weller did a fantastic job. Yeah, he really uh, did. And you did as well, really reacting did, and overreacting. Did, did. But it was, it, it, was, it was an amazing episode. Yeah, I'm going to play a small clip of that because I just want to get into the science of it or the science fiction yeah. of it. Just one second. Let's just hear what, there's something else in that scene that I love uh, that uh, Peter and you are talking about. God is science. God is polio and flu vaccines and MRI machines and artificial hearts. If you're a man of science, then that's the only faith we need. And like, you know, uh, talking, I mean, you have to watch the shot. I can't give you the episode as a listener in one quick mm. brush because it has so many themes. But one of the themes is what we just spoke about there. And I wanted to pivot a little bit because from what I've heard, and, and certainly when you watch the show, it's true that Fringe is about, if you haven't seen it, and by the way, what a great show to watch during this time if, if you're looking for something to binge uh, watch. But, you know, it's sort of a show that's like a Twilight Zone, Cole Shack, uh, The Night Stalker or something of that nature. But the point is, 
fringe is uh, sci- science that we're almost there, science that is discussed, but is it plausible? And I've heard in my uh, research is that, uh, John Noble, you had a position here that you wanted to just ensure that the writers made the science and the science fiction of Fringe at least plausible. It's something that possibly could happen. And if that's true, why did you do that? Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, that was very much part of it. Uh, well, as I was developing Walter Bishop, and that was also a big research project for me <laughs> to get that character, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm just trying to think what I was thinking then. What was the question again? Sorry, sure, no sorry. problem. The, the idea of plausibility I, of the science fiction aspects of so, the so show. I, uh, I, I thought about this guy, brilliant, brilliant scientist, uh, had been incarcerated for a long time in, in solitary, solitary and so forth, but he was a brilliant, brilliant man. And uh, I, so I, I, as I was going through it, I, I come to scenes, and some of them were not uh, particularly, some of the experiments were, were a bit silly. Uh, I used to say to them, please don't give me anything unless it's plausible, as you said, in, in science. And, uh, and if, you, if, you do, if you're going to give me a silly scene, I don't mind, but make sure that you do it when I'm stoned or, or high because that will justify the stupidity of it. And uh, but give me, and so they would, and then I'd have to research. You know, it's interesting. They would. We were talking about things in fringe, as you said, not too far in the future. When we were talking about uh, parallel universes and so forth, uh, that was, uh, just, it, when we started off, it was sort of around the beginning, and I used to read the science books about it. By now, everyone knows about it and has opinion, and that's so so fast. But but it was predicted uh, uh, or in that show, and uh, I I don't know where, where it would go, but it's fascinating to have that door open, uh, isn't it? That door in mind that says, God, there's a lot more out there than me. And uh, so the fascination with it all. Yeah. And that is yeah, one aspect right. of what I loved about the show. There's many aspects, and we'll talk about more. Mm. But uh, one of the aspects is the the idea that let's expand our mind a little bit and look beyond. That's why I kind of like science fiction. Good science fiction predicts the future if it does it well. I mean, if you look at Star Trek, they had the cell phone be- 40 years before we even thought about it. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's interesting. And speaking of Star Trek, just for kicks, I want to play a quick, quick clip here from a gentleman from Star Trek that was on Fringe and get a reaction. Yeah. Oh, you have good reason not to trust me, but I'm afraid you're going to have to. Walter is in trouble, and I'm quite confident we don't have much time. What is William Bell really up to? What are his real intentions? Can we trust him? We have to find out. We will find out. I hope we'll find out. I think we'll find out. <laughs> there we go. That clip is, of course, of Leonard Nimoy. I've met him a new, n- number of times just briefly. My impression of the gentleman was that he's a is a gentleman. He was a gentleman who was friendly, he was caring, and we all have egos, but he was able to, of course, what would you say, stow his ego. He it never got in the way of conversation, and uh, I don't know if you had that same experience, or I know you became friendly with, with this gentleman uh, during the time of Fringe. We did. We connected. Uh, look, when when it was announced uh, that uh, that character was going to be played by Leonard Nimoy, because there'd been stuff flying all over the place, and Leonard had had basically very much retired. He, he wasn't well, and uh, he basically retired. And and AJ, uh, not AJ, which is, uh, producers anyway, uh, yeah, JJ. contacted him and be- begged him, begged him to. I think, I think, no, I think the it was one of the showrunners, uh, and. Uh, Conduct, conduct. And so Leonard had a look at the, the show and he said, yeah, that's exactly very good. I will do it. And he, he came on and uh, and I, I was really honoured to, to, to talk to him, to be with Honoured, I mean seriously honoured. Not overawed, but just on. And we just connected, mate. Just connected so much. One of the, I'll tell you a charming bit about that, though. We were doing a scene uh, together and uh, he, he said to me, when you're doing that, can you keep your face towards me? And I said, well, I can't get away. He said, because I, I, uh, I'm reading your lips. He's dead. He was, he was actually had to look at my lips to see what I was saying so he could respond. And that was the, the, the degree of faith that we had in each other uh, that I could do that. And he could do that, my God. Uh, but so, yeah, he, was, he couldn't hear what was going on, but he could read it. You know, he also, uh, he was a fabulous photographer. You know that. that uh, uh, just, look, he was, I told you I was on it, but he was just such a beautiful, beautiful man. That's what I thought. And I said, oh, my God. And, and I, I was a 
amazing scenes with him. I think I might have done, I might have done the last with him, his last acting scene. I'm fairly sure I, I, that he has, and that in itself is kind of he puts a lump in my throat because then he, he did he died after that not so long, and we didn't catch up again uh, uh, before he died because uh, I had a standing invitation to go to with he and his wife for dinner, which apparently is almost unheard of, but but we didn't. Couldn't do it because I was up in Canada, and uh, he died. So, what a wonderful yeah. tribute, though. I mean, he was, you know, he, he to come out of retirement and not be well, but for this show because he believed in it and, and enjoyed, yeah. uh, just as Peter Weller yeah. did. I mean, Peter Weller told us also the reason why he did that show. He was you know, kind of poo-pooing episodic TV here and there mm -hmm. at the time in his life, and his wife had read the script, and he read the script, and he was just blown away by the writing. And then, uh, of course, you heard him as uh, as he was on a show. was very... Um, uh, very high praise upon yourself and and the cast, and he really enjoyed his time on, on Fringe as well. So I think that's you know it, it's it wasn't just gratuitous to get movie stars and and people that are uh, famous on this show. Uh, it was for a purpose, and they did a tremendous uh, job adding to the show. What I'd like to do when we get back from this commercial break is talk a little bit more about uh, the relationships you had. Uh, and the themes of the show and, and go beyond. We have you, there's other things that you were yeah. in, but uh, I really do enjoy the themes of what went on in that show. And I'm just mm -hmm. so happy to talk to uh, John Noble. We'll be back right after this on Everything Old is New Again. Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. I want to give you your life back. As a father, how could I not do that for you? What I said in the tape about stealing time with you, I meant it. I would trade it for the world. <laughs> you are my favorite thing, Peter. My very favorite thing. Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. That is a scene from Fringe, the finale of the season. I should say the series finale, too, of season five. And we're here with John Noble acting that scene that is very memorable. If you haven't seen it, it makes five years of watching Fringe worthwhile. And the reason why I say that is uh, twofold. Uh, number one, this show developed and showed the relationship of a grown son and an aging father, uh, the love, the humor, the friendship that they developed. And I challenge you to show me any form of entertainment that features that relationship that comes to mind. I'm sure there is, but it's not prevalent. And I really enjoyed that aspect of it because, of course, I'm a dad, and I certainly relate to that scene and what's going on there and you'll have to watch fringe to get more into it but it's one of the most moving things you're going to see on on uh, on the screen and besides that the show in general is great family entertainment and so i want to open this up a little bit more with with john noble and ask uh you know can you uh, or do you agree with what i'm saying there and if you do what do you think of the state of entertainment with respect to family entertainment the, 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 well the fan base of, of Fringe huge actually very devout and uh, and they are very informed as well that scene that we just heard by the way that was written also by uh, Joel Wyman the same fellow that wrote uh, White Tulip but he had said to me earlier he said I've got a scene in the finale John he said it's between you and Peter he said I, I, I can't wait to show it to you but I, I can't wait for your reaction and uh, so w w when it came along, amazing. That line, you know, my favorite thing, my very favorite thing. That's what Joel had said to his son. He'd used his own uh, words in it. But anyway, get to the point. So Josh and I had worked very hard on that relationship, seriously hard, right from day one, so that it wasn't any cliche in it. And it was tough getting to love each other again. You know, we played that all the way. And, uh, and Josh and I just, uh, we would always, before this scene, we really need to discuss, uh, it was done to one take, I did mine in one take. They, did, mm. they didn't want any more. Then they took, came over my shoulder and did 
hip, and he flew it. He blew it. No, not blew it. He flew it. He was amazing in that scene. One take. That was it. This important scene was done in two, two takes, one from each side, which is just uh, shows how, how intense and uh, how compelling it was uh, the way we did it. They, they said, no, you can't. Let's not do any more of that. That's fantastic. And I loved it. And, and yeah, we were crying. Yeah, it's amazing because, of course, that was the end of the show, too. And those are those two characters going a separate way eventually. And and so yeah. I'm sure we had some simpacato there as well. But the the relationships that you develop on screen and in acting in general um, mm. is so interesting. And I, we just focus on this show as an example. Uh, but all of your work contains this where these characters grow from the beginning of the series uh, or the, or even your entry into the series until the end and of course that's writing but some of that has to be the writers seeing what you can do what you are doing with the character and maybe that influences them a little bit as, as to the words they use for the character or the scenes that they develop uh, certainly that was seen what we heard was perfect but uh how how is it that you are able to develop these relationships on all of these shows on on uh, you know uh, Sleepy Hollow and and so forth that is so memorable um, just from just just from your uh, your 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 intake or your presentation of the words on the page. I mean, the, I know that's a difficult thing, but you do it so well. You interpret these flat words on the page, and of course, that's your job. But you know how you get there, and all of the experience you have, I'm sure, is leads up to it. But a little peek into your you know into your mindset is that how you're able to make these things so memorable. Okay, uh, oh, uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful point you've just made. In this, and good point fantastic point yeah uh, look i think one thing that i do is i find out where the relationships are you know if i go into a guest i find out the relationships and then i can uh, i can build on that pretty and, and and also there's an example when we started off the the show there was a uh, jessica nicole was playing this uh, astrid character and there was it was a, it was, a ne- it was a dead character there was nothing there was nothing there and uh, uh she was just sort of hanging around in the background and so uh I made a deal with Josh. I said, let's include her in every scene. Let's make sure she gets it. And so we did. And so we were doing some intense scene. And I said, Astra, skip me something. And we cut to her. They had to cut to her. Then so she came in. And she finished up being a really uh, terribly important part of the fringe and a wonderful relationship between her and Walt. And it was so. perfect too developed of the but but here's the thing. You did that and then in the show it's sort of a little humorous that this character that you're playing just he's absent minded, if you will, in some ways, or he's focused, I should say, on on what he's doing and the, the mundane is not important. So he sort of doesn't let himself memorize her name. So he's saying yeah. it's calling her something different almost every episode. And then at the end, the last episode, and this shows the growth I think it bookends it, where you actually, you know, the character actually says her name properly, and mm, uh, that was good. important for you. Um, you know, you, it's good talking to you, mate, because you really know this stuff. Uh, Thank yeah, you. That was in the amber, and we had that discussion, and, uh, and uh, it was very moving. And, and then uh, she was leaving, and I said, "It's a beautiful name, Astrid." Right. At which point, uh, at which point, that <laughs> just even cracked, you just fell apart, crying, and uh, it was just. An extraordinary scene to do again because of the relationship we had developed over the years. And uh, I love doing that scene with her. I just love advise with her and Peter, who were the two main uh, love affairs in a sense. In right. The, the show. It's exactly. And but what a great tribute to you as an actor too. Not to put too much praise on you. I know you. We want to be modest here at some level, but I'm not going to be modest because uh, with you because I, I think about what you did there. You you wanted to include her in the show and it, it developed her character. It developed her ability to, to. I'm sure she was a great actress beforehand, but I'm sure she learned a lot from you and from the experience. And then to have it bookended with with that with the writing sort of complimenting what you were doing off uh, off screen or at least uh, mm-hmm. trying to include her in this because listen she's on like I'm assuming you're saying to yourself she's on the stage why are we not utilizing this person she's in real life she wouldn't just be standing there and, and nodding right I mean, <laughs> well if she, if she no she, well, she wouldn't be in the picture if that's what she's doing you know right. you, you cut to a person when you, you when you need a reaction a character may say something which can be interpreted several ways but the reaction of the listener will tell them how to interpret it so if they're not listening, for example, basically acting 101, if they're not listening, then it doesn't happen. Right. And, uh, and and she, there was a beautiful uh, um, 
episode we did where Walter got lost in Chinatown. I can't remember the name of it now. Beautiful episode, and uh, and Astrid uh, Jessica went went searching for him, and she and it was very moving, and she uh, couldn't find him, and eventually he turned up, and they had a lovely scene together there. I think that would have been, and, and I think Jessica had to cry, and she said to me, "I've never cried uh, on stage before," and uh, we just talked a little bit about. What, what goes on again it's just listening being there let your character do it let, don't you worry about it. let your character listen and then she did and, and uh, because everyone interprets things differently don't they and, yes uh, so and but that's the but, director in you too though i mean you've got you've directed all of these plays before yeah. this and uh and then switch gears it seems to to, to actings but um certainly i presume that the, that experience as a director certainly couldn't have hurt uh in that situation and in general right no look it, it i think you would be very careful uh, i that you you don't be a director. In other words, you don't uh, perhaps tell other actors what... You, I never do that. that I, we hate that when another actor tells us what to do. I wouldn't do that. I, it's just... It, it's not that level. But did it, does scared. it inform you as to how you're going to por- portray your, your, your you know, character mm-hmm. in, in that, you know, you have that point of view of... of I presume directors, you know, in plays, especially, I guess, would help an actor here and there to give them a motivation or to help them with a line and in some emphasis here and there, no? Or, or do you not do that no, as a director? No, well, yeah. Another one, please say, you don't give line readings. Look, I, I can do a, a lot of different characters and uh, uh, interpretations, and sometimes I'm not getting it from the actor, uh, uh, and, and I'm very tempted to show them. Look, shit, Ed, come here. This is how it's done. <laughs> Boom. Right. But that would be dreadful. Right. And uh, so I don't do that. I have to, to allow them to find their own journey. You must do that. Not my journey. It's not my journey. Right. So it's, it's, it's that's a very respectful yes. But we theatre is different though because. Very different from uh, television. In theatre, you know, you might do three and a half weeks rehearsal at the stage you'd sit around and discuss a whole set of things uh, in the beginning and then rehearse it. And we never do that. Uh, I mean, it, working in television, there's, there's no rehearsal. Uh, you, you, you get called onto the set and the, the director asks for a read-through and you do a read-through. And that, as much as anything else, is to help the camera find the positions and... Uh, and after that, you just fly with it, but there's none of this uh, preparation. Right. So well, uh, uh, it, I hate to interrupt. We will come back right into this. Everything else new again with John Noble talking all things acting and more. We'll get into a little, uh, uh, I don't know, how about we talk about Sleepy Hollow a little bit and, uh, you know, the other yes. projects. So let's talk well, with John to- Noble right here and everything else new again right here, right now, right after this. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show. With Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You don't look well. You look as spry as ever. My compliments to the virgins whose blood you bathe in. I see the opiates haven't dulled your wit. Nor has old age withered yours. I didn't come here to exchange barbs. Why did you come here? Why do we ever meet like this? You've made a mess, Sherlock. I'm here to fix it. There we are. Everything old is new again. We're not trying to fix anything other than your mundane day, if you will. We're having some fun here on the radio with John Noble from Fringe. He also was Sherlock Holmes' father in elementary. He was Henry Parrish in Sleepy Hollow, certainly in Lord of the Rings. A little bit of 24 there, three episodes, if you remember that terrific show. And the list goes on and on and on, that's for sure. But I want to leave us a little time to talk as opposed to going through this tremendous resume. But... when the, the offer came about, I would say, for 24, for Sleepy Hollow and Elementary, a lot of these projects had already started, had already been going, and then yeah. they're asking you to come in and create a character or help to create a character. What's it like to come on to an existing project and be given, let's say like with 24, given three episodes uh, to interact with that cast and you know then you're, you're, you're out? But, of course, you want to make your you know, your role as memorable and poignant as possible, but these other characters have already had their chemistry developed. It must be a different kind of a skill to develop your character in that short period of time to stand up to and be memorable to all the others that we know from the show already because it's been on for a couple of years. Well, the same process. I would 
look to see if there's any hints or clues in there for me. And then, I, then I just go in and I actually play a lot of it by ear because some of the lead actors can be not, not that accommodating towards uh, guests. Get, uh, guest acting is really hard. But I just do it and then I stick with my guns and uh, I, I don't, I'm not arrogant. And if it's good, they'll run with it. And uh, that gives us at least something to launch up in history. And that happened certainly with, uh, with the Sherlock Holmes piece. I mean, Johnny, Johnny Lee was tough. And, uh, but I didn't let that worry me. I just did my job and eventually we finished up getting on very well. And, and uh, similarly on the 24th thing, you know, you go in there and go, whoa, what's going on here? But uh, I don't get anxious about it. I, I've realised something which surprises me is that, you know, I have absolute confidence in my skill, skill set. And that's an amazing thing for anyone to say. But it's there. It's been acquired over 40 years. And that's important. I think an important lesson, too, in some way for all of us in the bigger picture. You know, we have children, and, and again, we'll go back to that just for a second, to help to develop mm. children and children's minds and so forth. I think oh, yeah. acting is important, and it's not bad. I mean, you know, everyone's down on, oh, don't brag and so forth. I understand that. But you still, there's a difference between bragging as a child and, and being kind of, uh, you know, egotistical, as opposed to being confident, even as a child, in what it is that you do and do well. And isn't that part of growing up is to figure out what you do what you enjoy what you do well yeah. and yeah. to have confidence that you do it well that's okay no, i don't particularly like uh, it, it when anybody uh brags and tells lies you've got to die right but you know <laughs> the idea is though that if you've got a child that's let's say 10 years old and and, and wants mm -hmm. to pursue acting and yep. or singing or whatever it might yep. be in the arts yep. let's say and they have a talent for it it's okay mm -hmm. to let them know that that you know what you quietly can acknowledge that you've got some confidence in what you're doing and go yep. forward with it that, mm -hmm. as you're just saying that's an important aspect of what you do mm -hmm. is to acknowledge that what you do and you do it well it gives you that extra ability to maybe to improv when you need to as you say in the past on yeah. tv oh, you've improv uh, absolutely i mean one of the things he, he's, he's one from a teaching one but i used to run, run these they were pretty intense uh, classes for professional people basically to do with camera technique but to, to get them settled and they were teenagers i used to give them a meditation beforehand but the question i would ask them individually look in the face are you capable of a great performance my god it frightens them you can see the blood drain out of their face and I'm asking again, are you capable of great performance? They're going to say yes. They have to, or else they shouldn't be there. Right. And uh, and and that in is, and then I, then then I would follow it up with this uh, guided meditation, where they go in with that belief that, that what they have, and then they would do these scenes, and uh, it gave us a basis to work from. And I love doing. I got to get back to that point about uh, sorry about family. I've had that feedback from so many people that that was the show that their family could watch together from, from grandkids to you know, grandmas. It, it had something for everyone. And I've had that said to me so many times, so I can not believe it. Uh, I, I guess I, it's one of the things I'm most proud about, really, is that uh, connection, the fact that kids are, you know, we're not bloody foul mouth killing people all the time and being dominated by greed and sex. We, we're people, and uh, and those kids are gorgeous, and they understand. Oh, kids, hey, kids can read BS from a mile away, you know, and... Uh, so you've got to be really good to work for kids. Uh, oh, I'm actually thinking of president of cranking up uh, something for a hospital visit uh, for one of our uh, one of our friends uh, has a six year old and uh, darling boy, and last week he was uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, leukemia, hmm. acute myeloid, very bad. Poor poor little bloke, you know. And and I was thinking, what the hell can we do? So I, I'm trying to work out. Yeah, hospital visits are fun. They've got to be, but it's also COVID nineteen times. So I don't know, right. but I'm going to do it because I want to do. It. I want to do something. I want to do something, and I see. I, I see the reaction of of, of, of kids to, to good teaching when I watch my, my daughter work, and uh, you know, it's inspiring to see how she relates to children. She it's like she goes into their heads. I'll tell you what, and this is an extraordinarily difficult time that can be overlooked. You know, my kids, uh, they missed out on, you know, three months of schooling of their friends. And at that tender mm -hmm. age, 8, 10, 11, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they're having difficulty. You know, they, oh, just talk to them on the phone or just do a FaceTime or whatever. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Their conversation, their uh, essence of what they communicate with each other about is while they're in school. And did you see this happen? And, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have the experience that we have of all things and all topics to talk about. So now we've just taken away their experience 
librarians in schools who've taken out away the major topic that they talk about with their friends, and now it's become difficult for them to communicate with their friends because the commonality is gone, if that makes sense. So it's yeah, a really no, difficult a very, time for them. That's a very interesting observation, uh, isn't it? What are the, what are the say, well, without two, there are a couple of saving things. One was the, the, the quality of the – Sad did the teaching, and she's a qualified teacher, and uh, she, so she taught – well, the kids were home. Uh, well, they're still home, but you know, it was it was wonderful, wonderful to watch. And and she, what she did was uh, she'd line up uh, Zoom sessions, and, and the blokes in the, from the class would all get on the Zoom and have a yarn together, and uh, that was a wonderful thing to watch. They also communicated a lot over games, a uh, computer game that they they're obsessed with, you know, and and they've got other people that talk back to them and they play against people. I, I should have another look at that, but it's amazing. It's, they are communicating. Right, but yeah. uh, but I think the more uh, the, the perhaps I didn't say the more sensitive. I don't know. Some people will be affected more than others. <laughs> we, I think so far we've, we've been okay. Look, you've been through it with your, with your kids. You know, homeschooling is not is not easy right. at all, and we face this tremendous dilemma. I think schools are going back. Are your kids going back to school? Yes, they're going back September tenth. And there is trepidation, you know. My little guy's like, oh, boy, I'm going to be wearing a mask all the time. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit, it's going to be different and, and change at that age, too. And she, he hasn't yeah. seen his buddies. So it's, it's a little trepidation. And they touch him. each other. Right. Can you imagine that, that, kids? God almighty. Yeah. So, of course they will. Look, uh, uh, what's happened here is that the, the school uh, that, that, our, that our kids go to, they've decided not to open. They'll do it online. And this, this reaction from some of the parents saying, you know, there's no rules you know, school and, and Sam will be teaching a pod here with a few other kids just to continue them through. But it's awful to see them robbed of their, uh, as you said, the socialisation. And they also miss out on all their sports, you know, because sports for kids are great. Absolutely. And so I mean, every, it seems like every night we were either at, at baseball or football or something or other. And, uh, I enjoyed that when I, when I was here. I would always go to those games uh, for both of them. Beautiful things, and that's where they communicate as well. Right, right, exactly. Now, they didn't have that. That's all cancelled. Right, so. exactly. So uh, finally, to round the corner here on this and bookend this, if we can, I just wanted to ask you because you know our theme is uh, everything old is new again, as we know. We took a, you know, a little bit of a spotlight, if you will, and look at the foundations of the past and and how it's experienced and related to today and how it affects entertainment today certainly elementary and and uh, sleepy hollow or classic works of the past that were reimagined and that you were part of uh do you feel that uh that theme at least in general everything old is new again that the things of the past should be reviewed and taken a look at to see what we can learn from them because we're not reinventing the wheel every time we perform another uh, piece of art no Oh, mate, of course, we, we, not of course. We don't take, we, unfortunately, we don't take much notice of history. Uh, it's, it's astonishing to me. Look, look at this collapse that's happening here, here in the States at present. Uh, and it is sort of a cultural and economic collapse. But if you had studied, you would find out that it was predictable and uh, that it would be, cre- after a certain time, this empire would fail and it would be certain things indicators. Now, a uh, fellow called Jared Diamond uh, wrote, a, uh, wrote a book so several great books, actually. But one of them was to do with this collapse of empires. And it's all the same. And we're doing it too. And no one's listening. It's, it's frustrating because I love America but, and I don't want to see it fall into a hole. I think it can come back. I always have confidence in that. But it's got to come back as a nicer nation without, uh, without the corruption, the greed and... Yeah, that's just, that's the thing to write. And I think it will happen. I don't think we'll tolerate it anymore. I agree. We've uh, become a little more awake uh, to what's yeah. going on behind the scenes. Listen, it's been fun. It's been terrific. I'm <coughs> very happy to have had uh, John Noble on Everything Old is New Again. It's been a tremendous conversation, something different, some fun to the radio, something to uh, enjoy. And, and, John, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, Douglas, it's a pleasure. And I love your show. And uh, and, and the, the, the amount of research you've done is, is it just makes my life. My job at this end so easy, so I thank you for that, my friend. My pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've been a fan for a long time, and uh, I'm happy. Maybe someday we'll revisit. I'd be love to have you have your back. We'll see what we can do. I'm sure. I, I'm sure it can be arranged. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. terrific. Okay, <laughs> tune in next week for more uh, fun, thrills, adventure, and everything old is new again. Uh, America's pop culture entertainment talk show. Come on back next week.